In this video, you will learn to recognize when to use correlation, how to interpret the magnitude and direction of a correlation, you will be able to explain the influence of outliers, and describe the difference between the Pearson correlation and the Spearman correlation. Francis Galton created the notion of a correlation. He said that two variables are correlated when the variation of one is accompanied on average by more or less variation of the other and in the same direction. The example he gave was the relationship between the length of the arm and the length of the leg. He said that people with short arms tend to have short legs and people with long arms tend to have long legs. Galton gave us the definition of the concept of a correlation. It was his protege, Carl Pearson, who actually developed the equation that we use today for computing the correlation coefficient. Galton was interested in the study of heredity. He collected a lot of data on anthropomorphic measurements, such as height and weight. Here you see a scatter plot of Galton's height data. On the x-axis, we have the mid-parent height, which is the average of the parent's height. And on the y-axis, we have the child's height. This plot includes both men and women. And Galton actually applied an adjustment to the female height by multiplying it by 1.08. So instead of plotting male and female separately, he included them all in the same plot. You can see that it appears that the points are following somewhat of a positive trend, meaning that the points tend to point upward from left to right. It also seems that the points are fairly tightly grouped, indicating perhaps a moderate correlation. The difficulty with trying to interpret the strength of the relationship from a scatter plot is that it's very subjective. One person may look at this plot and say it's a small correlation. Another person may look at it and say it's a moderate correlation. What we'd really like to have is a number that quantifies the strength and direction of the relationship. And so Pearson developed the equation for the correlation coefficient. This correlation describes the strength and direction of a linear relationship between two variables. It's computed by taking the covariance of two variables and dividing it by the product of their standard deviations. It requires two assumptions. One is that the variables must be interval or ratio, and the other is that we have a linear relationship between the two variables. This correlation doesn't work well if you have a curvilinear relationship. The correlation coefficient takes on values between negative one and positive one, and values close to one and absolute value are strong correlations, and values close to zero are weak correlations. Let's look at some plots to look at the relationship between the scatter plot and the correlation coefficient. Here we see two perfect correlations. On the left, we have a perfect negative correlation where the correlation equals negative one. And you can see that all of the points fall along a straight line that slopes downward from left to right. It's that downward slope that indicates a negative correlation. On the right-hand side, you see a perfect positive correlation, and all the points fall along a straight line that slopes upward from left to right. And it's that upward slope that indicates a positive correlation. This slide shows two very strong correlations. On the left-hand side, we have a correlation of negative 0.95, and I've drawn an ellipse around the points in the scatter plot to show that the points are very tightly grouped together. The ellipse also makes evident that downward slope from left to right. On the right-hand side, we also have a correlation that's very strong. The correlation is positive 0.95. The ellipse drawn around the points is also reflecting that tight grouping of the points, and you can see the upward slope more clearly. So when we have a large positive correlation, the points don't fall exactly on a straight line, but they're still tightly grouped together. And if it's negative, they point downward from left to right. And if it's a positive correlation, the pattern of points slopes upward from left to right. As we decrease the correlation more, the scattering of points tends to spread out more. And you can see that here on the left with a correlation of negative 0.8, that the ellipse drawn around the points has sort of widened a bit. There's still a clear negative trend so that the pattern of points tends to point downward from left to right. On the right-hand side is a similar correlation, but in the positive direction. Here we have a correlation of 0.82. The ellipse drawn around the points is still tight, but it's not as tight as it was with the previous correlation. 
and the pattern of points slopes upward from left to right, which indicates the positive nature of the relationship. Here we have two medium correlations. On the left, we have a correlation of negative 0.45, and you can see the pattern of points is still clear, but the points are spread out quite a bit more. And in fact, the ellipse is beginning to look more and more like a circle. On the right-hand side, we have a correlation of positive 0.39. The pattern of points is also tending to get wider, but it, there's still a clear positive trend in that the points slope upward from left to right. Now looking at a small correlation, the pattern is less evident. On the left-hand side, we have a correlation of negative 0.25, and it's, it's really hard to judge just by looking at the picture of the nature of that relationship. With the ellipse drawn around it, it does seem that it points downward to indicate a negative correlation, but it's less evident because the correlation is so small. The same is true on the right-hand side where we have a correlation of positive 0.25. It's very difficult to visually judge the strength of that relationship, and it's also hard to tell that it's a positive correlation. The ellipse drawn around the points helps, but it's still not that evident that it's a small positive correlation. Finally, we have a picture of no correlation. Here, r equals 0 0.04, and if you draw an ellipse around all of the points, it doesn't really look like an ellipse. It looks more like a circle. That really tells us that there really is no relationship here. The points just appear to be randomly scattered in the plot. With correlation, we know that values close to 1 indicate a strong relationship. However, we can also square the correlation coefficient to get the coefficient of determination, and that helps us understand the strength of the relationship. The coefficient of determination tells us the percent of variance in one variable that is explained by the other variable. To understand the coefficient of determination, I have drawn a Venn diagram. The circle on the left represents the variance of x, the circle on the right represents the variance of y, and the part where the two circles overlap is the shared variance, or r squared, the coefficient of determination. The greater the value of r squared, the more overlap between those two circles. If the correlation was 1, then 100% of the variance in x would be accounted for by y, and those two circles would completely overlap. The table on the right shows values of r and r squared. You can see that even when the correlation is 0.5, only 25% of the variance in one variable is accounted for by the other. If you increase the correlation to 0.7, you're still only explaining less than 50% of the variance in one variable by the other variable. This is one reason why people tend to use the rule of thumb that 0.8 is a strong relationship, because once you get to 0.8, that's when you're explaining more than 50% of the variance in one variable with the other. In fact, with the correlation of 0.8, the coefficient of determination is 0.64, indicating that 64% of the variance in one variable is accounted for by the other variable. When you are conducting an analysis with correlation, there are really two statistics that you should report. You should report the correlation and the coefficient of determination. For example, the Galton height data had a correlation of 0.5, and we would report this as the correlation between mid-parent height and child height is 0.5. Therefore, 25% of the variance in child height is explained by mid-parent height. It's important to keep in mind that correlation does not imply causation. When describing the coefficient of determination, I use the term explained by, but do not interpret that to mean caused by. The reason correlation does not imply causation is that we have three possibilities when there's a relationship between two variables. It could be that X causes Y. For example, we could say that training causes improved race performance. The other possibility is that y causes x, meaning that race performance might cause people to train harder. Finally, we could also have a third variable that causes both x and y. For example, it may be that commitment and motivation cause increased training and better race performance. Whenever you're describing your results from a correlation analysis, try to avoid any suggestion of causation in your report. The Pearson correlation coefficient is affected by bivariate outliers. A bivariate outlier 
is a point in the scatter plot that might have a very unusual value for x, an unusual value for y, or unusual values for both x and y. The way bivariate outliers affect the Pearson correlation coefficient really depends on where the outlier is located. Let's look at some examples. Here we see a scatter plot with 20 points on it. The correlation is 0.67. One of the dots is a solid field circle. What I'm going to do is move that one single point, and what you'll see is how much the correlation coefficient changes as I move this point to be a bivariate outlier. If I move that point to the upper right corner of the scatter plot, the correlation has increased to 0.82. If I move it again, the correlation is now 0.42. If I move the point to the bottom right corner of the scatter plot, the correlation is not only smaller, but the direction has reversed. The correlation is negative 0.35. If I move the point again, the correlation is positive, but it's smaller than the original value. Moving the point to the bottom left corner of the scatter plot, the correlation has increased from its original value, but it still remains in the positive direction. An outlier at this point decreases the correlation, but it still remains positive. If we move the outlier to this point, the correlation is smaller than its original value, and it's in the negative direction. Finally, if we move the outlier to this point, the correlation has reduced to 0.24. These figures should illustrate how sensitive the Pearson correlation is to these bivariate outliers. The question you may have is, what do you do when you have a bivariate outlier? One choice is to omit the observation with that point. It's not a great idea because you're basically reducing the data you have available. A better idea is to use a different correlation coefficient. Spearman's rank order correlation is an option when you have bivariate outliers. This correlation works much the same way as the Pearson correlation. However, instead of correlating the original values, what you do is you first rank the values of x, then you rank the values of y, and you use the ranks in the Pearson correlation instead of the original points. Spearman's correlation has slightly different assumptions. The data may be ordinal interval or ratio, and the relationship only has to be monotonic in nature. It does not have to be linear. By monotonic, we mean that as one variable increases, the other variable increases, or as one variable decreases, the other variable decreases. Returning to our bivariate outlier examples, with those 20 points, the Spearman rank order correlation is 0.69. If I move that solid filled circle to the upper right corner, the correlation doesn't change at all. It still remains at 0.69. If I move it again, the correlation is only 0.6, which is not that different from the original correlation. If I move it to the bottom right-hand corner, the correlation is lower at 0.41, but it still remains positive. Remember that when we had the Pearson correlation with this exact same data, the correlation was not only smaller, but it actually reversed to the negative direction. Here, Spearman's correlation is 0.63. If you move the point to the lower left corner of the scatter plot, the correlation is 0.69, which was the same as the original correlation. Here it's 0.58, and here it's 0.41. Finally, Spearman's correlation with the bivariate outlier at this point is 0.56. It should be evident in these figures that the Spearman correlation is less affected by outliers than the Pearson correlation. For this reason, we would say that Spearman's correlation is robust to outliers. This table shows the different values of the Pearson and the Spearman correlation for each of those data sets that had bivariate outliers. You can see in the bottom row of the table are the standard deviations. The standard deviation of the Pearson correlations is quite a bit larger than the standard deviation of the Spearman correlations. That's indicating that the Spearman correlation is less affected by outliers, by bivariate outliers, than the Pearson correlation. In summary, Pearson's correlation describes the strength of a linear relationship between two variables that are interval or ratio in nature. Spearman's rank order correlation describes the strength of a monotonic relationship between two variables that are ordinal, interval, or ratio in nature.
Spearman's rank order correlation is more robust to outliers than Pearson's correlation. And to help us describe the strength of a relationship, we can look at the coefficient of determination, which describes the amount of variance in one variable that is explained by the other variable. Finally, remember that correlation does not imply causation.